Now we're going to look at some of the other types of cells and how they're put together. All right, fungal cells, fungi. Um, the aspects of fungi that we're going to be concerned with are going to be yeast and mold. So we're not necessarily talking about things like mushrooms. And so there's other, many, many other types of fungi uh, like that, but, but we're going to look at yeast and molds. Most fungi are going to be unicellular. That means one cell. Um, they may form colonies. Uh, there are a few more complex fungi that are going to be multicellular. Uh, microscopic fungi are going to exist in two basic forms, the yeast and the hyphae forms, okay, which is also called filamentous. Uh, so a yeast cell is distinguished by its round to oval shape and by the mode of asexual reproduction, okay. A yeast cell has a round oval shape, is going to grow buds that are going to be genetically identical because it's asexual. They're going to bud off and then become separate cells to reproduce. Hyphae are going to be these more thread-like molecules here. Uh, they grow on filamentous type fungi. Those are going to be more of your molds. Some forms form pseudo-hyphae, uh, which is a chain of yeast cells that kind of looks like hyphae that just basically stay together uh, when the buds uh, form. They just kind of stay together in a row. So it's a chain of yeast cells, okay? A really interesting thing is that some fungal cells are dimorphic. Di meaning two. Morph, we tend to think morph means changing, but morph means shape. And so this just means they can have two different types of shapes. They can have either the yeast-like form or the filamentous form, and that can depend on the conditions. Some, it just depends even on the temperature, which is pretty cool. Most of the uh, fungi that can do this, however, tend to be the more pathogenic type fungi. So uh, we have to kind of be careful with that. So we're gonna look at this um, septate and non-septate fungi in a little bit. Septate means separation. Non-septate is all, uh, called coenzetic or co-ed, and so they're kind of all together. But I think we come back around to that. But if not, I've explained it. So this graphic here shows the structure of a yeast cell and all of its major organelles. But the main reason I included this was that you could see here, whoop, I turned that off, how it buds, okay? And so it's it's forming this little bud, which I said is genetically identical because it's asexual reproduction. Uh, and then this is where it is forming pseudohyphae, okay? Here in the middle, this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, which is, uh, well, we'll get into that a little bit later, but this is just a good micrograph picture showing you what that actually looks like. We've got over 300 different species of fungi that can actually cause human disease, which is a lot. Uh, we have three types of fungal disease found in humans. That's gonna be a community acquired, hospital acquired, and then opportunistic infections. Community acquired infections are caused by environmental pathogens, okay, which are obviously in the community. These are gonna be things like histoplasmosis, and that comes from birds or bat droppings, okay? or coccidiomycoses. Anytime you see mycoses, you need to be thinking fungi, okay? And this is found in the soil, causes uh, upper respiratory flu-like type systems. Uh, Hospital-acquired uh, infections are gonna be caused by fungal pathogens that are found in healthcare facilities. And this is generally more long-term care because you have people there for a very long period, they're in confined spaces, and you have someone going from room to room. Um, that's carrying something with them. Opportunistic infections are going to be caused by things that are typically very low in virulence, meaning a normal healthy person would not get sick from these, but they are going to infect someone with an immunocompromised uh, system. Um, someone like, that has something like HIV, and this was actually very important because this was um, very assistive in diagnosing what HIV really was. I remember in the 80s when this first came about in America and it was called gay cancer and we had no idea what it was. And they called it gay cancer because when it first showed up in America, that was the population it was targeting. It was targeting young, healthy, um, homosexual men in their early 20s. Now, worldwide, it is actually higher rated in heterosexual, but it's just the way it kind of came into America. And so they were just uh, 
baffled by this disease that where these 20 year old men were coming up with these opportunistic infections like fungal infections in the, in the lungs that they should not have been getting and it was these opportunist opportunistic infections that helped lead them to kind of figure out what was really going on and help us to discover hiv uh, so mycosis is the term for fungal infections, and they vary uh, according to their portal of entry. A portal of entry means how the pathogen enters the body, and also they vary by how much tissue involvement they display. Those that are opportunistic, we already said, don't cause an issue for a normal healthy person, but somebody who is immune compromised, um, for example, somebody with AIDS can be affected by them or somebody with skid or, or another immunocompromised type of disease, okay? Uh, fungi are also more likely to cause a toxicity or poisoning instead of an infection. Um, for example, Aspergillus flavus produces a poison called aflatoxin and that uh, affects grain and has increased cases of liver cancer uh, in some countries from this aflatoxin. Fungal cells also give off substances that cause allergies, okay? Uh, so toxins produced by poisons and mushrooms, however, now those can, can induce actual neurological disturbances and death. So that is really important. You should never go out and pick mushrooms. You have to really be an expert to pick the type of mushrooms that are safe to eat. Um, I guess that's it. All right, so there are a lot of species of fungi that are pathogenic to corn and grain. We have a lot of corn grown in our area, and they have to test for these uh, species. These can damage um, crop yield, reduce how much you're able to get. It can also then cause disease in the animals that later on eat the contaminated feed. Um, <clears throat> So up to 40% of fresh produce actually has fungi on it. So there's a reason to shop your local farmer's market. <laughs> Just like bacteria, fungi are not always bad. Um, they're actually really important in decomposing organic ma uh, matter, which helps to put material uh, minerals back into the soil. Um, they form associations with plant roots like legumes and increase their ability to absorb water and nutrients. We have engineered them to be able to produce things that we uh, find useful, alcohol, acid, organic acids, and vitamins. And they actually have are eaten like blue cheese um, and can be used to actually impart different types of flavoring to food. So let's look at the different types of ways that fungi actually receive their nutrition. All fungi are considered heterotrophic. Hetero means uh, different, right? Homo means the same, hetero means different. Trophic refers to feeding. So heterotrophic means that they obtain their nutrients from a wide variety or different organic materials. Uh, and so those sources of nutrition will also refer to as substrates. Most fungi, so this is all, most fungi are saprobes. Okay, so they obtain their substrates from dead plants and animals. Fungi can also be parasitic uh, on the bodies of living animals or plants. They obtain their nutrients by secreting enzymes into the substrate that break it down into smaller molecules so it can be absorbed. Fungi also thrive in really adverse environments and those that have high salt or sugar concentrations. Most of the microscopic fungi are going to grow in a loose association or colony. Over here on the left, you can see a colony of yeast. It's much like bacteria. They have a soft, uniform texture and appearance. Uh, colonies of filamentous fungi are going to have that more cottony, velvety type texture to them. So here's looking more at the little uh, filamentous type here. Mycelium, this is a mass of hyphae that makes up a colony of mold. Uh, we have the septate fungi, and remember the septate, they're separate, they have separations or septum. Um, these are cross walls that allow um, the flow of organelles and nutrients between compartments in the filament, okay? Uh, between adjacent compartments. And then we have this non 
septate or this coincetic, coincetic think co-ed, they're all living together, that do not have the separations or cross walls, but it's a long continuous type cell. The cytosol and organelles will move freely from one region to another. Okay, we also have um, classification of two different types by function. So we can have vegetative states and reproductive or fertile states. Vegetative hyphae are mycelia, and those are going to be responsible for the massive growth that's seen on the surface, and it's going to penetrate down to the substrate in order to digest it and absorb those nutrients. During development of a fungal colony, the vegetative hyphae will produce reproductive hyphae uh, that are going to branch off. And these are responsible for the produ production of fungal spores, which are reproductive bodies. Fungi have complicated reproductive strategies. They can grow from a simple outward extension of the hyphae or by fragmentation where a separate piece of mycelium can generate an entire new colony. Spores though are the primary reproductive strategy for fungi. They help with dispersal through the environment. Um, they are easily dispersed in air, water, and living things, particularly due to the nature of their small size. We're going to focus on the most common type of subdivision, and that's how spores um, arise. So an asexual spore is going to arise due to mitosis of a single parent cell. Um, sexual spores are going to be formed by fusing two parental cells. So you've got two different, that's where you get the sexual from, and that's going to be via meiosis. Uh, this method is going to increase genetic variation. Two we have two types of asexual spores. We have sporangia spores and candida spores, okay? Sporangia spore and candida spore. And that's what you see uh, shown here. This is the sporangia spore and these are the candida spores, all right? So sporangia, sp sporangia spores are formed by successive cleavages, cleavages with kind of a sac-like head called a sporangium. You can see that right here. This is the sporangium and it's kind of in a sac. Okay, so this is enclosed in a sac. Um, that's going to be attached to this stalk, all right, and that gives us the, the stalk here is going to be the sporangia four. Candida spores don't have a sac, all right, so they have free spores and they're not enclosed in a sac. That's the biggest difference. Most fungi are going to produce sexual spores at some point, and there's many different methods that they use. They can link genes from two parent fungi, creating offspring, and that's going to give us a shuffling of genes, from um, some from each parent. These um, variations can give us those advantageous ad, uh, adaptations. So this gets back to natural selection here, okay? Sexual spores can vary from just simple fusion of fertile hyphae to a complex union of the male and female stru structure. So they have both those asexual forms and sexual forms of reproduction. Moving on to protozoa, and these are some of my favorite, and I really wish we had more time to study these, but we really just don't. But these have some really cool little critters. Uh, the name comes from the Greek word for first animals. That's what protozoa mean. They're characterized more for their phys similar physical characteristics than how genetically related they are. Uh, we've got 12,000 species at least of single-celled creatures. Most of them are harmless, free-living um, and inhabitants of water and soil. A few of them are pathogenic, um, which gives us millions of infections for each year. Uh, and you can see some of these different ones here. Here you have um, an amoeba. This is a dinoflagellate uh, and some other things. Protozoa are going to be unicellular. They're single cells and they're going to have the same, most of the same major organelles as eukaryotic organisms, except for chloroplast. Um, organelles uh, are going to be, the organelles are going to be highly specialized for feeding, reproduction, and locomotion. The cytoplasm is going to be divided into a clear outer layer called the ectoplasm and a granular inner layer or region called the endoplasm. The ectoplasm is going to function in locomotion or movement, feeding, and protection, while the endoplasm is going to house that mitochondria, food, and uh, contractile vacuoles. Some protozoa have even organelles that are kind of like a primitive nervous system that helps to coordinate their movement. 
So in order to get around, protozoa use pseudopods, cilia, or flagella to move through fluid mediums generally. They do not have a cell wall, so that allows them to be very flexible. The cell membrane is going to regulate movement of food, water, and secretions. Ciliates, ciliates, okay, this is a ciliate here, um, have a shape that remains constant or cigar shaped for this particular one. Okay, so they're going to have an actual shape, something like an amoeba up here at the top. Um, that's going to be more um, changing. Okay, so most amoebas, some amoebas, sorry, can have hard calcium shells, which is unusual. Most are from three to 300 micrometers. And remember, a micrometer is one times 10 to the negative six. Uh, but some are actually large enough to actually be seen swimming in pond water like Euglena, which is what you see here at the bottom. It kind of has a cigar shape to it. And it's green, so it's obviously photosynthetic. So the protozoa we study are usually going to be heterotrophs, meaning, of course, they, they get their foods from different complex organic um, in that form. Uh, they're going to be free living scavengers, uh, and so they're going to feed off of dead plants or animal debris or graze on bacteria or algae. They may have special feeding structures like an oral groove. They can uh, absorb food directly through the cell membrane. Many pathogenic species can live in the fluid areas of their host and then actively feed on their tissues. The main limiting factor for them is going to be the availability of moisture. They need moisture. So their predominant habitats are going to be fresh in marine water, soil, plants, and animals. But they can survive in extreme temperatures and extreme P extremes of pH. Protozoa have um, a life cycle where uh, they're called trophozoite when they are moved uh, in their motile or mobile feeding stage. Uh, they need a lot of food and moisture in order to stay active. Many species then can enter a dormant resting stage, which is called a cyst. So this occurs primarily when you have hostile or unfavorable environmental conditions. So it's kind of protective against heat, drying out, which is called desiccations, um, harmful chemicals, and so they can survive during adverse periods of time. They can also be dispersed by air currents, which help spread disease like amoebic dysentery. Uh, if they have enough moisture and nutrients, then the cyst is going to break open and release the active form, which is the trophozoite. Here we see the general life cycle uh, exhibited by many different protozoa. The first stage here is going to be that trophozoite, which is that active feeding stage. When environmental conditions are not favorable, uh, like it's too dry, we like nutrients, then the cell is going to round up and lose motility and become a cyst. So this is early cyst formation. And then here it is fully developed into a cyst, and that's a dormant resting stage. So with the return of favorable environment, it is going to, the cell wall of that cyst is going to break open and the trophozoite is going to become active again. The life cycles of protozoans do vary from very simple to complex. Several protozoan groups exist um, only in the trophozoite phase, and then some can alternate between trophozoites and cysts. And here are two important um, examples. And like I said earlier, uh, you really should start making flashcards of these or keeping records of these so that you can kind of study them as we go and add information to them so you're not trying to learn it all at the end. One of these is going to be Trichomonas vaginalis and this is a common sexually transmitted disease. Uh, actually they're called usually STIs now. It's infection disease. It's, it's just play on words. Uh, this one does not form cysts and it's got to be transmitted via intimate contact, which is sex. We also have into in, amoeba histolica and Giardia lamblia. Uh, and these both form cysts and are easily transmitted by contaminated foods and waters. Water. Time for one of those NCLEX prep practice questions. So let's put what we've talked about to, into practice. <clears throat> so a client is diagnosed with trichomonas vaginalis, which we call the trick. Okay, trick. Um, 
Which of the following would indicate that the client understands the method of transmission for the disease process? So the client states that she A, ate contaminated food, B, drank contaminated water, C, had intimate contact, or D, had too much sun exposure. So which of these would be indicative of Trichomonas vaginalis? This should be an easy one. It should be C had intimate contact. And we do need to make sure that patients understand the mode of transmission. So one, they can prevent themselves from getting it and two, they can prevent themselves from spreading it. How do protozoa reproduce? Well, all protozoa reproduce with a simple asexual method, usually mitotic division. Some uh, pathogenic species like malaria atroxoplasmosis reproduce asexually with multiple rounds of division in a host cell, and they can have rather complex life cycles. Sexual reproduction also occurs during part of the life cycle, life cycle for most protozoans. Ciliates are going to participate in conjugation in which two cells fuse and exchange micronuclei. This is going to result in new um, genetic combinations and of course that's advantageous and it gives evolution something to act on. So this is a look at some of those major pathogenic um, protozoa. We've talked about into amoeba uh, histolica. Uh, this is, can uh, cause um, an intestinal disorders. Nigleria or acantha amoeba. These are the brain eating amoeba. And we actually had someone in Arkansas um, in the past few years had this. Uh, let's see, some more familiar ones. We've got the ciliated protozoa, Ballantinum. Pitidium coli, uh, that's usually more going to affect pigs or cattle. Giardia, you've probably heard of giardia, giardiasis. Um, and we have trouble with this sometimes with vegetables, and this is again going to be a diarrhea causing. And then there's the trick. Uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, trypanosomiasis is going to again be um, intestinal distress. Uh, Leishmaniasis is the disease caused by Leishmania, Leishmanias species, uh, and so you need to make flashcards of these guys, all right, and you need to know the, the protozoan name, and you need to do this for bacteria, for all of our microbes. You need to know their name, the name of the disease, and don't mix those two up because it's easy to do sometimes. Uh, and then all of the details about them. What is their reservoir? What is their source? What what in, uh, symptoms do they cause? Are they gram negative? Are they gram positive? Those types of things need to be on your little cards. Here's some more here. We've got plasmodium species. We've got vivax falciparum. Uh, these cause malaria. Toxoplasmosis is caused by Toxoplasma gondii. Um, we'll get into uh, more details about all of these. Cryptosporidiosis is going to cause intestinal systems and cyclosporiasis is also going to be intestinal. Moving on to the helminths, which these are our worms, flukes, roundworms, and tapeworms. These are all called helminths. These can be long, like tapeworms that are going to be up to 25 meters in length, small, like a roundworm, that sh which is less than one millimeter. Um, <clears throat> we study these due to the fact that even though they're not microscopic, they have infective properties and they can produce microscopic eggs or uh, larvae. So they have part of their life cycle that is microscopic in nature. Okay. Um, adults are usually going to be large enough to be seen with the naked eye. And some of these you're probably familiar with. Um, dogs tend to get a lot of these. I'm trying to find this. It's not clicked here. Ascaris, that's, that's worms that dogs get. Pillworms, whipworms. Uh, these are tape, tape worms. This is a different type of tape worm. Uh, sorry, I'm off the screen over here. And then flukes. Um, not all flatworms and roundworms are going to be parasites. Many live free in the soil and water. You'd be shocked at how many worms are actually in a little square inch of soil. Parasitic helminths, though, spend part of their lives generally in the gastrointestinal tract. We're going to look at two major groups here based on body type. That's going to be the flatworms, which is platyhelminthes, which is usually what you're going to hear me say. I'll say platyhelminthes a lot. And then we have our roundworms, and I usually say roundworm. I don't say ashelminthes, but that's the other word. Uh, flatworms are going to have thin segmented bodies, okay? Um, thin segmented bodies, they're going to be divided into groups. We're going to have our cestodes, which is going to be like tapeworms, um, trematodes, there's going to be flukes, 
uh, are going to be the trematodes, okay? And so you can kind of hear in this tapeworm see those segments, all right? Um, cestodes are more ribbon like in arrangement, okay? Um, trematodes are going to be your flukes, they're going to be flat, ovoid type bodies. The round worms are going to have a more ob ob oblong, elongated, cylindrical type shape. They do not have segments. Um, and this is a lovely picture of them down here in the bottom. So this is a cestode or a tapeworm. And this shows these scolex, which is basically the head portion and the suckers that it uses to attach to your body. And this long segmented body here, um, you can see we've got views of mature, what we call proglottids. And proglottids are these sections. And these are basically little sections full of fertile eggs or babies. They are full of hundreds of them, okay? Um, and so each proglottid is full of all those babies. It's just fascinating how many babies they can actually make. Um, and so this is an actual tapeworm here. Uh, the structure of the trematode or liver fluke is here. And if you'll notice the structure of these, um, these are basically big reproductive guys. That's all they are made for. So this is the testes that's taking up all of this area ovaries here, seminal receptacle, vas deferens, and so most of the body is pretty much just about reproduction. This is uh, a scarus, which is a nematode around worm. You've got a male and a female here, um, and again, helminths are going to be multicellular. They have organs and organ systems. Uh, most pathogenic helminths, however, have a very highly developed reproductive tract. Um, all of the other systems are reduced. So just like I was saying a moment ago, they're pretty much just big little bodies full of nothing but reproductive organs. Okay, another NCLEX prep question. So a patient has been diagnosed with a parasitic helminth infection. Which of the following is not a helminth that causes diseases? So this comes back to making those flashcards I told you about. We've got ringworm, blood fluked, pork tapeworm, or pinworm. pinworm. Okay, so which one is not a hel helmet? Well, this should be obvious, but uh, hopefully, hopefully you realize this. What is ringworm? Ringworm is a fungi. It is not an actual worm. The rest of these are worms. So the complete life cycle of helminths includes the fertilized egg, which is the embryo, the larval and adult stages. Most adults get their nutrients um, and reproduce sexually in the body of a host. Nematodes are going to have different uh, or appear as different sexes. Trematodes can be either a separate sex or they can actually be um, hermaphroditic, meaning they can have the male and female sex organs in the same individuals. And then cestodes are usually going to be hermaphroditic. So sources for human um, helmets are generally going to be in contaminated food, soil, water, uh, or infected animals. Um, this is Enterobius vermicularis here, uh, the pinworm, which is very commonly affects uh, human beings, especially small children. Um, and that's because little two-year-old boys and girls are kind of the dirtiest creatures on earth. They may scratch their anus and then put their hand into their mouth or in somebody else's mouth. I mean, they put their hands everywhere. They just don't know any better. And so the route of infection here is oral, okay? Oral intake and occasionally penetration uh, of tissues. The life cycle is going to start when a person picks up the eggs from their hands, like scratching, okay? Um, or maybe they were handling a dog that had them. Um, the eggs are going to hatch in the intestines and release larvae that are going to mature into adults after a month. Um, and then those male and female worms are going to mate and the female is going to leave the anus and deposit the eggs. This is going to cause an itchiness and what happens if you're two year old and something itches, what do you do? You scratch it. Okay. And so that's going to spread the eggs even further. Okay. Um, so the resulting infection here is intero enterobiasis and is isolated basically to the intestines. 
I don't include a lot of these medical moments, but you really should read all of these. Uh, but this one is really important. We tend to think of these types of infections as being other people's diseases, and like you don't necessarily get them if you are unclean. Sometimes that is true. Some diseases are more likely to happen in unclean situations. Sometimes that's not by choice. Uh, but some of them are just, that's just the way it is. You know, some people, you just get them, all right? So one quarter of the world's population is infected with roundworms. That's 25%. That's one in four people in the whole world, okay? Now, that's not necessarily in the U.S., but in the U.S., some very common um, infections are going to be Chagas disease, which is Trypanosoma cruzi, and that's a protozoan. Then we have neurocystokeracosis, which is going to be from the tapeworm Tania sodium, or toxocariasis, which is going to be worms that actually travel through the tissues and cause things like blindness. Toxoplasmosis, this actually um, affected um, my mother, and I'll get into that late, uh, later, my brother actually. Um, 60 million in the U.S. are infected. It is a protozoan, and you get it by cleaning out things like the cat litter box, or that's the main mode of transmission. Or trichomoniasis, which is definitely very uh, common uh, STD trick. Uh, that is a protozoan of the genital tract. This is a really good slide to use to make your cards that I hope you're making with. I'm not going to read through all of this because you can read, but this shows you uh, the common name, uh, the scientific name, the disease it causes, um, what host it requires to live in, and then how it is spread to human beings. And again, how are eggs deposited? Fertilized eggs are often going to be released into the environment. They're going to have a protective shell and generally some extra food to uh, help the development of the larvae. They can be vulnerable to heat, cold, drying, or predators. Some helmets can lay up to 200,000 to 25 million eggs a day. So remember those proglottids we were looking at? Think about every one of those proglottids and then they're filled with hundreds or thousands of babies okay so we have about 50 different species of helmets that can cause disease in humans these are distributed all over the world there is definitely a higher incidence in tropical areas we just have a, an environment that is more conducive to them um, the yearly estimated um, amount of cases is in the billions, especially for developing countries. Um, and in, in America, 50 million hel helmets is actually a conservative um, number. So these are prevalent.